All right, everyone. It's Dr. Dan Ritchie, president of the Functional Aging Institute. And I just want to welcome you to our webinar today. Really excited to have Dr. Emily Splickle with us today. And I would love for you to go ahead and type in either the chat box uh, or the um, question and answer box where you're from, where you're listening from, maybe what time zone you're in, what country you're in. Um, it's always fascinating to me, Emily, how many people around the world tune into our webinars. Uh, last week, we had someone from Dubai, Australia, and the United Kingdom all at the same time, which I, I found quite interesting, people in the middle of the night. So um, Dr. Emily Splickle is a podiatrist, a human movement specialist, uh, a global educator, and the founder of Evidence-Based Fitness Academy. Um, she's also the creator and the inventor of the Naboso. Did I say that correct? Naboso? Naboso's correct. All right. Naboso barefoot technology with over 18 years in the fitness industry. That one actually shocked me. I had no idea you've been around for 18 years. So uh, kudos to you. Um, Dr. Splickle has dedicated her medical career towards studying postural alignment, human movement as it relates to barefoot science. Uh, Cody and I um, often refer to you as the barefoot expert and people ask us a lot about barefoot stuff and we always just send them to you. We're like, just go check out Dr. Splickle's stuff because she knows a whole lot more about it than we do. So thanks so much for your time. Um, I'm going to turn off my video uh, while you give your presentation and I always remind our audience that you'll be around for live Q&A at the end. So if you have a question, Feel free to type it in, but I'm not going to interrupt you again uh, until we get to the end. So please take it away. Okay, sounds amazing. Thank you to everyone who is tuning in to learn a little bit about brain, breath, and barefoot, which is the philosophy under EBFA Global and the applications of how you can use this information for fall reduction programming. Um, I'm Honored to be working with FAI and for them hosting this webinar. I am really excited to announce that I will be presenting at their 2019 summit. So if you are attending that, I will see you there. If you are not familiar with me and my background, uh, Dr. Splickle, Dr. Emily, I am a podiatrist, so a clinician, also a human movement specialist. I try to take a very unique perspective when I am seeing my patients. I really consider myself much more of a functional podiatrist than a traditional podiatrist in the sense of pushing surgery and orthotics and looking at the foot from an isolated perspective. Everything that I do is based off of the foundation of integration, functional medicine, psychosomatic theory, so a really holistic approach to help my patients. But then that philosophy also trickles down into my education under EBFA Global, our certifications under EBFA Global, Barefoot Training Specialist being one of those. And then as was mentioned, I am the founder of Naboso Technology, which I will be speaking about um, quite a bit towards the end and then we do have a great offer for you at the end related to Naboso but I just want you to know a little bit about my background and then my relationships obviously with with my companies so topic today fall reduction programming and the utilization of brain breath and barefoot so this is clearly going to be linked to sensory stimulation sensory information the optimization of processing that sensory information and why this is so important is because there is a huge concern over fall risk there is an increasing fall risk as we get older just in general we have an age-related decline in foot sensitivity you could consider that a small nerve neuropathy that a lot of that goes undiagnosed or uh, under appreciated by the medical communities. But we also have a lot of clients that are experiencing chronic neurological conditions, whether that is Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, post-stroke, neuropathy, whether it's diabetic or chemo related. And then of course, there's many other neurological conditions or just chronic conditions in general that increase that fall risk or a movement dysfunction uh, risk. The concern when it comes to falls is really what that does to that individual from the rest of um, their lifestyle subsequent to that fall. They now live in a state of probably fear, limitations, reduced independence, and that has a heavy, heavy emotional burden on them, their families. It has a huge cost to the healthcare system. So fall reduction as a um, public health 
excuse me, public health concern or way to shape your practice and what it can do for these clients is really, really powerful. So I'm excited to be speaking about this from an integrated perspective and through the utilization of the three areas that we focus on under EBFA, which is the brain, our breath, and of course, barefoot. We are going to start with the brain because of course, this is going to be our foundational way of processing the sensory stimulation. This is, just a warning, a content heavy presentation. So if you have not had your espresso yet, make sure you grab that cup real quick. If you do happen to want the PowerPoint slides, I will have these accessible. You can either email me or I will have them accessible to, to everyone at FAI and they could send those to you. I will give my email towards the end. So brain, breath, barefoot, we're starting with the brain. Now, when you're thinking about brain and brain optimization and why this is so important for all of our clients, regardless of age, but especially as we are aging, is that brain function is not just cognitive. You're doing crossword puzzles, you are doing um, memory recollection, or you are learning a new language, whatever it is to stay sharp and keep your memory on point. That is a part of brain function. But when we look at optimizing brain function, I want you to start thinking that it relates to IQ, EQ, and MQ. IQ is, of course, our cognitive processing. EQ is going to be the emotional flexibility. That is hugely important. I just touch the tip of the iceberg on that topic in this webinar, but know that that is a very deep topic that you can go into through EBFA's education. And then finally looking at MQ or motor coordination. So if you are on a goal to optimize the brain, that really is for memory, intellect, the emotional flexibility or the emotional control and self-regulation of your clients. And then of course their motor coordination and their ability to dual task. When we look at the brain, the best way to understand this and to break it down into the different divisions is through what's referred to as the triune brain theory. So triune brain theory uh, divides the brain into our reptilian brain, our early mammalian brain, and then our new mammalian brain. Reptilian brain, of course, that's going to be the oldest one. That is your brain stem. And then that one directly links into and starts to influence the early mammalian brain, which is the limbic system. And then finally, that ultimately has a connection with and an influence on the new mammalian brain or the neocortex. So those are going to be the three main divisions that we're focusing on and then exploring their relationship to each other. Starting with the brain stem. So the brain stem is marked here in the big circle of the red. You can see that that's kind of like the base of the brain connecting to the spinal cord, your brain stem. Now your brain stem is responsible for survival. Reptile survival. Think your most baseline survival needs. If anyone is familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, on the baseline is food, hunger, reproduction, shelter, right? So that's really what we're thinking on here. So that would be from a brainstem function is your autonomic nervous system and your brain telling you, are you safe or not safe? If your needs, whatever that means to your brain, your needs are met, you are then safe. You can then go into the rest of the brain processing and you can learn new skills. You can um, emotionally regulate better. However, thing about the brain stem and understanding brain processing is that a lot of individuals unfortunately get stuck in the brain stem in their repti reptilian brain because they are so stressed out. So a stressed out client of yours that is stuck in the reptilian brain and their primary basis is just survival, they're going to have a hard time with memory recall, learning new skills, being productive at work, because again, they, they can't go through the rest of the brain until they get out of that reptilian brain. So they have to, in a sense, get out of their own way. Now there's a part of the brain stem that I wanna focus on. The part of the brain stem that we're going to focus on is called the reticular activating system. The way that you can think about this is that it is like the ignition to your brain. It is what regulates waking up the brain, sleep-wake cycles. It connects your brain to the limbic system, to the neocortex. Your brain must be awake 
if you are going to learn. Brain must be awake. So for any of the movement specialists and trainers and coaches that are out there, if you are working with your client and doing movement, movement MQ, right, ties into brain function, if their brain is not awake, the reticular activating system is not online, they're not getting anything or barely anything out of that session. So we want to think about how can we wake up our brain first, turn on the ignition to the brain, and then they're going to get so much more out of that workout, especially if you're doing fall reduction programming or coordination training, et cetera, or dual tasking. You want to set it up so that that client can win at the programming that you create for them. So that's going to be getting into and accessing the reticular activating system of the brain to turn it on just like the ignition. So really interesting things when it comes to the reticular activating system is that you can actually stimulate it in several creative ways. What's interesting is that your eyes and your ears are linked to the reticular activating system. Your eyes and your ears. So this means that if you do eye movement exercises, Moving the eyes, eye movement exercises, you are essentially stimulating the reticular activating system and waking up the brain. Exact same thing if you are going to coordinate vestibular exercises. Vestibular exercises are also going to wake up the brain by stimulating the reticular activating system. One of my favorite ways is by using the tongue ligaments. So if you yawn, Essentially, when you are yawning, you are stimulating the tongue ligaments that are li linked to the, to the vestibular system, and then that wakes up the brain through the reticular activating system. If you don't want to yawn <laughs> in the middle of the gym or wherever you are, you can simply push your tongue into the palate, and that in its sound sense will also wake up the reticular activating system. Later on, I will speak a little bit more about some of our central stability when I do some of the core activation and foot core sequencing through um, the fascial lines in the body under EBFA. I will also cue the tongue into the palate. It's just a big cue that I use for patients and when I teach movement uh, classes. The effect of that is not only am I stimulating their core, but I'm also stimulating the brain. So a really powerful trick that you can use. One last one that you can do is if you rub your ears, so outside your ear here, if you rub that area, you are also stimulating the reticular activating system. So just remember that. How can we incorporate that into our programming? We will see in a little bit. Okay, now we're proceeding. Your reticular activating system is awake. Your brainstem is online. Now we're going to go into the second division, which is your limbic system. Now for everyone who's listening, some of you may be familiar with the limbic system. If I was to ask everyone, this is a rhetorical question, but <laughs> if I was to ask you what you think of or what you know of the limbic system, most people typically say emotion. So they've, they've either read about it or heard about it, that the limbic system is an emotion center. And that's the way that you want to think of it as well. The other area of how you can think about the limbic system is emotion is one side. Second side that deeply links to emotion is stress. So your stress pathway is regulated through your limbic system. Your limbic system is being talked to by the brainstem, and the brainstem is your really your survival. Am I safe? Am I not safe? So if your brainstem does not feel safe, it technically could talk to the limbic system and then stimulate the stress pathway, which I will go into in one moment. So limbic system, we can break down into your thalamus, hypothalamus, basal ganglia, going to be a huge region, amygdala, and hippocampus. Thalamus is going to be a uh, access point for sensory input. So that's the way that you can think about your thalamus, your hypothalamus. Hopefully you guys are familiar with that one. Hypothalamus, where you want to start thinking about the hypothalamus, this also regulates body temperature, again, a little bit more in uh, sleep and wake cycles. Hypothalamus is hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, your HPA axis. So if you've ever heard that, right? HPA axis is the pathway that stimulates the release of the hormone cortisol. 
cortisol is our stress hormone, which is necessary in controlled stress, survival stress in a controlled environment, but the chronic stimulation or the chronic talking to the limbic system about survival, survival, survival leads to chronic stimulation of the HPA axis and release of cortisol. Chronic release of cortisol leads to central adiposity. It decreases your immune system. It does something to the hippocampus, which I'll mention in a moment, but it's something that we want to make sure that we're controlling in our clients as well. Next area I want to focus on, which is going to relate to the topic of fall reduction, is the basal ganglia. Basal ganglia, the way that you can think of this area is that it has to do with movement, gross voluntary movement, but it also has to do with fine motor movement. Fine motor movement, meaning eye movement, eye muscles. Really interesting uh, research I'm going to show you in a moment. The next area, the amygdala, heavy emotion center. Not going to go into that, but when people have poor self-regulation and self-awareness of their emotions, so whether it's from an anger perspective or an anxiety perspective, they are essentially said to be running off of their amygdala. They're not kind of talking to their self from the neocortex and inhibiting some of those behaviors. Finally, the last area is going to be the hippocampus. The way you can think of the hippocampus is memory, learning and memory. What I was trying to get to earlier is hypothalamus, HPA axis, stressed out cortisol. Cortisol is toxic to your hippocampus, which means that chronic elevation of cortisol can lead to compromised memory, learning, and recall. Alzheimer's is centered within the hippocampus. So there's a lot of really interesting research looking at the connection between stress uh, and perceived stress throughout your life and the risk or the propensity for Alzheimer's because of that individual's emotional state and stress. Check that out more. All right, this area here within the red circle, that is your limbic system. That's not referred to as your midbrain. Your midbrain is actually part of your brainstem. This is the middle of your brain, but it's not your midbrain. Um, whoop, oh, I apologize. They had them all down here. So as we said, thalamus relay station, hypothalamus. This is going to be your HPA axis, stress, basal ganglia, movement, amygdala, emotions, hippocampus, memory. All right, so the basal ganglia. So just remember that there is a deficit. I believe oh, that's not on that page. That's okay. So there is often a deficit in the basal ganglia and basal ganglia function and stimulation in those who have MS and Parkinson's. But we can start to see this in some of our other clients as well. Now, if you have an area that's responsible not just for gross voluntary movement, but also fine motor, motor movement, imagine if you did fine motor, motor movement and it had an effect on that client's gross voluntary movement. That's actually what they see. So when you do eye movement exercises, eye movement exercises, small motor movement, you will actually see an improvement in balance in those who have a deficit within their basal ganglia. Parkinson's and MS, even though I use eye movement exercises for any of my clients or patients who have a fall risk. So here was a study, 2018 study, so new study, and what they saw is the, the efficacy of integrating eye movement exercises and visual stimulation for improving balance for those living with MS. There's what's called a BE, EMS, balance and eye motion exercise for MS. You can actually search that program and get the protocol that they used and how that improves sensory integration and brain balancing. The final area that we're going to go into is the neocortex. Now your neocortex, this is the new brain, new mammalian brain, and think of this as command central. Right, So we have the different divisions, which I'll show real quick here. We're not going into the different lobes, but this is going to be command central. So once you go from the brainstem 
into the limbic system and then into the neocortex. This is where we have higher processing, more complex motion and emotion comes from there. Motivation, obviously language and other aspects, but having the neocortex allows us to do most of what we um, uh, take advantage of every day of our, our learning, our complex motor tax, tasks, etc. Now there's one aspect to your neocortex that I want to focus on. It is the fact that we have two hemispheres, so the left and right hemisphere, even though some people are left brain, right brain, we are both hemisphered <laughs> and we need both of those hemispheres online. So not only does your reticular activating system have to be awake, but both of your hemispheres also have to be awake, okay? So how can we stimulate the corpus callosum to wake up both hemispheres and get that brain ready for movement, programming, skill development, etc.? One of the best ways is through crossing the midline. So doing any sort of crawling patterns, um, animal flow, doing any of like eagle pose. You can see this infinity sign. So how can we incorporate this? Think of with your clients when you're doing movement prep and getting them ready for that day's session. Can you incorporate some sort of eye movement exercise? An example that I use is they would hold something in their hand, draw the infinity sign, and they're following it with their eyes. So now I'm doing an eye movement exercise. Something is that in the hand, so you're going to stimulate another sensory input system that we'll talk about in a moment. You are crossing your midline, so you're waking up your corpus callosum, and you have that reticular activating system online. So it's a great way to get into the brain and get them ready for movement. So again, just to recap, your brain is shaped off of sensory stimulation. One of the philosophies that I believe in so much is that life is sensory. That sensory information must be brought in if you are optimizing your client's programming, fall reduction, or just movement in general. Way, the way that you stimulate the brain from the brainstem to the limbic system to the neocortex, ultimately that sensory information has to get to the neocortex because that is where the area that's called your somatosensory system sits. If you are not safe or you are stuck in the reptilian survival part of your brain, you cannot get into the more advanced parts of the brain. So waking up the brain, making sure that it feels safe, making sure that both hemispheres are online, then you are allowing all of that sensory information to come in and help that client with their programming. We're going to transition into the second part, which is breath. So breath is the second part of the Brain Breath Barefoot series. Now, when we're looking at breath, breath is a representation of your autonomic nervous system. So whether you are in a sympathetic state or a parasympathetic state, are you in fight or flight? Are you in restoration and rest digest? All of that ties into how your client is breathing. Now, how we breathe is linked to our internal perception of homeostasis, which is a representation or represented through your emotions. This is linked to our visceral fascial network, interoceptive system, and your gut brain axis. Now breathing, of course, utilizes our diaphragm. And if our client is not breathing the right way, utilizing their diaphragm the right way, because the diaphragm is linked to the pelvic floor and many of the other core muscles, that client's core stability will not be as optimal. So proper breathing patterns are necessary for deep core stability. The way that you can link and connect that diaphragm deep core stability is through what's called your deep front fascial line. Your deep front fascial line technically is what connects your feet to your core and is one of the foundation areas that we focus on at EBFA. If we can get more connected to our foundation, which is our feet, to our center, that is going to give a faster stability. I'm just going to shift a little bit just because we're doing a little bit of construction. Um, so your deep line stability is bringing in that diaphragm to pelvic floor. 
Now, another consideration for our breathing patterns in our clients is that the breath is the driver to stability. Your breath is the driver to stability. I always remember that. So if you are not incorporating breathing patterns yet with your clients or starting the sessions, making sure that your clients are breathing the right way, they may be trying to stabilize on a very unstable center of gravity or center of stabilization. Now, a few considerations when we think of how our clients are breathing. Now, there's two primary ways that we can breathe. You can breathe either above the diaphragm, which is called supra-diaphragmatic, or you can breathe below the diaphragm, which is sub-diaphragmatic breathing. You can think of the supra-diaphragmatic breathing pattern as one that is sympathetic or the survival style of breathing. That client is technically in a stressed out state and they are in fight or flight. Now this is in opposition to parasympathetic or a sub-diaphragmatic breathing pattern. The sub-diaphragmatic breathing pattern is going to be more of a rest and digest, a uh, restoration phase, you actually have a decreased sensitivity to pain. So if any of your clients are experiencing pain, when you are actually in a supra-diaphragmatic breathing pattern, you experience what's called allodynia. Allodynia means that you have a heightened sensitivity to pain or things that are not painful or should not be painful are painful to that client or to a patient. That is directly related to the breathing style that 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 patient or that client is, is conducting. Now, some of these comorbidities, if you, if you haven't dived into the path of breath yet, um, there's a few comorbidities that your clients could be experiencing that um, tips you off and indicates if you should be exploring breathing patterns a little bit more and the um, aspect of, okay, are they doing a supra or a subdiaphragmatic breathing? If your client has acid reflux or GERD, if they're taking any proton pump inhibitors, if they are um, a loud breather, if they're snoring, if you know they have a deviated septum, if they're a mouth breather, um, I had already mentioned audible breathing so you can hear them breathing. Do they have urinary incontinence because your diaphragm connects to your pelvic floor? So are they starting to show maybe not diaphragm issues, but they have pelvic floor issues, then that's going to represent this as well. Final one that I always mention, you can write it in your, your intake form if you don't want to ask it, but particularly for men, pain during sex. That indicates a deep core instability deep core instability. As soon as a client has deep core instability, you want to be thinking diaphragm, diaphragm, because again, I just want you to remember deep front line. So if we're trying to get that client into a proper breathing pattern, it means going into a diaphragmatic breathing uh, breath pattern at the start of the session. That's how I use diaphragmatic breathing with my clients and patients is I use diaphragmatic breathing as an activation. We use it to activate the deep core. So it would be done at the beginning of the session. It could be done at the beginning of their day um, or during their neuro reset that most of my patients are doing. It would be tied in just with the same exercises that we did, whether it was the eye exercises, crossing the midline. We now want to be incorporating diaphragmatic breathing to make sure that we are getting their deep core in a position that they could hopefully stay engaged. When you're doing diaphragmatic breathing, um, having them inhale and exhale through the nose is really important. I try to save mouth breathing for not doing an activation. When you're actually executing the exercise, that is completely different. But for the sake of activation, diaphragmatic breathing, I try to keep it all through the nose. Now, one last thing that I want to tie in with the breathing and the diaphragmatic breathing pattern is if you... You can't just tell your client to breathe the right way. Knowing that breath is the driver to stability, so we know breath is important, but you can't just teach them the, them the technique and then think that it's going to work once they leave the gym. Once they go about their day, since most people, when we go about our day, we are 
unconscious, right? All of our patterns are unconscious. And the way we breathe is unconscious because as part of the autonomic nervous system, it's kind of doing its own thing once we get busy or whatnot means that in some of our clients, we may need to explore a little bit deeper on what is the true driver of why they're staying so super diaphragmatic. That's where you start to look into a little bit deeper of stress drivers, their relationship to stress, their relationship to different emotions and emotional regulation, which is why I wanted to mention the stuff in the beginning about the brain and the limbic system and emotional processing. It's just another layer, not to make it more complicated, but just to emphasize that breath and breathing patterns in themselves are really powerful but you can't just teach it and tell it to someone and think that they're going to carry on with it. Um, sometimes we have deeper things that are happening. That would be a lot of the biopsychosocial stuff that I tie into my practice. I just want you to appreciate it. Okay, so we're going into our final area of the brain, breath, barefoot, and how we can introduce this into our fall reduction programming. This, of course, is going to be the hot area because it's feet and that's my specialty but with barefoot this is where we want to start thinking optimizing sensory stimulation to better control motor output and movement coordination sensory stimulation because we're talking about the feet we're obviously going to be talking about touch so the power of touch and what is so unique about the skin on the bottom of the feet and of course the palm of the hand same skin same nerves so the skin in the bottom of the feet, palms of the hands, this is referred to as proprioceptive system, mechanoceptors, haptic scepters. They have different names. They're all forms of exteroceptors and our relationship with the external environment. The more sensory information you bring in from these nerves that perceive the external world, the better your brain will have a relationship with that external world. So your brain needs to know where it is in space based off of that information coming in. So the stimulation of touch sensory goes from brainstem to limbic system, specifically the thalamus, into the neocortex, specifically the somatosensory system. So that communication, again, if you can't get out of the brainstem, you can see how it's going to be blocked the rest of the way. Touch is what's considered cholinergic, which means it wakes up the brain. Anything that is considered cholinergic, again, just think of waking up, activating, okay? Now, touch is very powerful to all other aspects of the brain. Um, if you're familiar with Jane Eyre, she's the creator of sensory integration theory. She does a lot of stuff with children and sensory processing. What she has stated and seen is that a decrease in touch has been associated with decreased reticular activating system activity, compromised learning, compromised affect, which is emotion, and compromised movement. So again, touch, that means touching something and then being touched. Touched goes both ways. So just know to touch and to be touched is really powerful from a learning, emotion, and movement perspective. This is for all ages. It's obviously really important as we are children, but even more so, it is uh, important as we age as well. So what your touch relates to, the different areas of the body, there is what is referred to as a brain map. So a brain map within your somatosensory system, okay, within your somatosensory system in the brain, you have a map and a representation of your external body and space. This picture, which is called a homunculus, is a representation of that brain map. So the map in the brain based off of sensory stimulation. You can see from the picture of the homunculus that the hands are really big, the feet are big, the mouth are big. And that means that these are the areas that are the most sensory sensitive. So if you are trying to optimize movement, you should be asking yourself, how can I bring in even more sensory stimulation through these different areas? So I can essentially homunculize my client. So this is the brain map, 
you can see that the body is kind of laying down and uh, the larger areas is shows the greater representation within the somatosensory system. Now, when it comes to the hands and feet, we have very special skin. Hands and feet has very special skin. The skin on the palms of the hands and the bottom of the feet are what's called glabrous, glabrous skin. So palms and feet, glabrous skin have haptic receptors or mechanoceptors, haptic or mechanoceptors. And these are sensitive to different stimulation. Some of the other input systems that you may be familiar with are Golgi tendon organs, muscle spindles. Those are different types of receptors. Mechanoceptors are very unique in the type of stimulation they respond to. Now there's four main mechanoceptors that you can find in the palms of the hands and the bottom of the feet four main mechanoceptors. So if you are trying to optimize sensory stimulation through the feet, you will want to know what your feet are even sensitive to. So if we take a look at the slide, we can see that there are four main types. Two of them are what's considered slow adapting, and then two of them are fast adapting. The slow adapting mechanoceptors means that they are continuously reading the environment. So if I'm actually standing in one spot in what's called quiet stance, there is a continuous reading of the ground, of the information coming through my feet while I stand statically, and it is the processing of that information that would control sway, let's say medial lateral sway. Okay, now this is as opposed to fast adapting, which essentially read the stimulus and then shut off. This means that you need to continuously be moving to stimulate the fast adapting mechanoceptors. Now, if we look at them a little closer, two that are slow adapting. First one of these is what's referred to as the SA1 Merkel disc. Your SA1 Merkel disc is sensitive to what's called two-point discrimination. Two-point discrimination, the best analogy of this is Braille. Braille, if you look at it, it's on every ATM. So the next time you're at an ATM, look at the, the, the uh, Braille dots, and you can see that they're actually a very specific distance from each other. The spatial acuity of the Merkel disc SA1 receptor is actually one millimeter, which means that a one millimeter placement, so that's as, as finite as it can be, is linked to that two-point discrimination. When I talk about Naboso in a minute, I'm going to be referencing the Merkel disc or SA1. Another aspect of the SA1 two-point discrimination, think Braille nerve, is that it is the most, most superficial nerve in the hands and in the feet. Most superficial, so it's the closest to the ground. Now your second slow adapting, SA2, Ruffini ending is sensitive to skin stretch. Now, how, how this ties into the SA1 is that when you are on a surface, two point discrimination surface, and the surface is perceived as rough, so smooth versus rough, when you're on a rough surface, you are then essentially stuck to the surface. So then when you try to move your foot and you're on a stuck surface, you are essentially stimulating skin stretch or the stimulation of the superficial fascia and the SA2 receptors that are sitting underneath the skin. How that translates to walking is that when we walk and we strike the ground, you are actually not just experiencing vertical ground reaction forces, but we also experience horizontal ground reaction forces that is translated as shear. So shearing forces are going to be stimulating skin stretch, which is an SA2. Okay, and then we go forward into our last two receptors, which are your fast adapting, FA1, FA2. You can see that both of these are sensitive to vibration. The FA1 is sensitive to a lower frequency. Think of that one as like a walking vibration, whereas the FA2, the Pacinian corpuscle, is more sensitive to a high frequency vibration. Think running, jumping, etc. Okay. Now, if we go forward, I want to show you the distribution of it. So this is the skin on the bottom of the foot, and you can see all the different receptors here. You can see the distribution of the different receptors. SA2, if you remember, that's your two-point discrimination. 
can see where that is located within the foot. Your SA2, this is going to be skin stretch. So skin stretch stimulation, it's gonna have a relationship to the SA1. FA1, ooh, you can see that that is all over the foot. That is one of the most prevalent ones in the bottom of the foot. And then the FA2, you can see that this is centered in the ball of the foot which makes sense. Remember FA1, FA2, vibration. What's interesting is that 70% of the nerves in the bottom of the feet are sensitive to vibration, 70%. Why I wanna emphasize that is guess what? The sensory stimulation is of dynamic movement. What is the sensory driver every single time you take a step? What feeds your nervous system and allows you to take the next step? It is impact forces. Your foot hitting the ground, creating ground reaction forces, actually creates vibrations. Vibration is the sensory stimulation of dynamic movement. And what else is also really cool is that your body uses vibration not only to know how hard you're striking the ground, but also to maintain dynamic balance as we walk. Your FA1, FA2, the nerves in the bottom of the feet, 70% of the nerves are vibration. We use vibration to maintain balance. Fall reduction, right? And then when you look at the sensitivity of the nerves in the bottom of the feet, the peak sensitivity of the nerves in the bottom of the feet is age 40. By the time we are 70, we need twice the stimulus to create the same response vibration and your inability to perceive vibration or use vibration is one of the leading causes of fall risk hands down any client any patient so that's where you want to be thinking of the shoes that they're wearing are you doing barefoot stimulation can we feel our feet can we feel the grounds can we feel the vibration we need to be optimizing this information because at the end of the day the only contact point between the body and the ground is your foot. It is the skin in the bottom of the foot. So this is where it's gonna lead me into Naboso. Naboso, if you are not familiar with it, Naboso is a textured mat and insole company that I launched last year. We are, in fact, the only textured mat and insole company that is on the market, and it is designed really for the purpose of improving balance, posture, and gait. The specificity of the texture on the Naboso products, you can see, is a two-point discrimination. So we are targeting, just like Braille, the SA1 Merkel disc. The height and shape of the texture is very specific. The distance between each of the textures is very specific. So we are trying to go after tapping into the homunculus through the skin in the bottom of the feet to then help the brain map perceive their body in space and hopefully help reduce falls. We have some really powerful results. Um, I'm gonna show you just a couple of them and then we are going to wrap up soon. So if you have any questions, you can start preparing those and I'll be going uh, over those with Dan. So this is a woman who has Parkinson's and on the left, this is her walking without the Naboso insole. So it's just her normal um, gait pattern on the bottom. Obviously, she's on a treadmill. On the top, she is open space. Thing that you can look at when you see the differences is her speed. The column to the right is after she put in the Naboso insoles. This is an immediate effect. She knows nothing about the insoles. And you can see an immediate effect of stimulating the skin in the bottom of the feet. She's walking faster. She has more symmetry. Her, perhaps her turnaround time, her arm swing will be a little bit more symmetrical. So you're seeing some really cool results of the stimulation of the skin in the bottom of the feet. And now when I travel and I teach about topics such as this and, you know, I speak about barefoot and then I, of course, am speaking about Naboso. Naboso is, is a product that allows us to stimulate the feet, which allows us to stimulate the brain. However, my goal even more so than 
just educating about Nimboso and that product that is available for patients and clients is to bring the awareness of the importance of the skin in the bottom of the foot. Ultimately, at the end of the day, that is my goal is having people think about how powerful the feet are. Whether you use Nimboso or not, I don't care. I would love if you use Nimboso, but I, I want you to just appreciate how powerful the feet are. So our last example, and then we're going into some questions. This is a, a, a wonderful woman, amazing woman. Um, I'll tell you a story a little bit after we see the pictures. So on the left column, this is, she has Parkinson's. Um, on the left, this is her normal gait. And then on the top right, you can see her walking after having the Naboso insoles. This is kind of the first effect. And then the bottom right, you will see what happens the longer that she wears the insoles. You can see barely able to walk. She's in like a, a towing gate, can't even put her heels on the ground. Top picture, she has the um, almost like a foot slap that she's experiencing. I'll bring it back. And then on the bottom, you can see that now she's running. So to go from the calm on the left to running, I mean, that just, that blows my world. All right. So uh, as you type in your questions, I just want to real quick give some of the websites for um, EBFA and Naboso. Please check out our certifications under EBFA. We have our Barefoot Training Specialist, Rx. We have information that's available online, online courses. Um, under Naboso, we have a 15% off code that um, and links that will also be sent by FAI. So please do check that out. The code for 15% off is FAI 2018. You can head to the website Naboso Technology or follow any of the links that are sent to you by um, Dan Cody and their team. And then of course, I'm going to be at the 2019 summit. Super, super excited for that. And we'll be there with some of the Naboso products and doing a pre-con and some lectures. Awesome. Emily, can you hear me okay? I can. Okay, great. Um, we got a bunch of questions coming in. You actually set the uh, the new record for webinars. I told you we were only allowed to have 100 people on live, and we got to 107. I'm not even sure how we did that. So. Get on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm guessing Zoom will send us the upgrade bill later. But, you know, <laughs> right. But that was cool. So, um, so Functional Aging Summit, um, you're doing uh, not only some sessions, but also a certification workshop, correct, the day before? Yes, I am. Yes. Awesome, great. So people should be looking for that. So I got a bunch of questions coming in. Um, Len asks specifically about peripher uh, peripheral neuropathy. Uh, okay. He says there seems to be limited research on the effectiveness of exercise, strength, flexibility, balance, so on to reduce the symptoms what foot sensory, somatosensory exercises have you found effective in working with PN clients? Okay, I'll, I'll try to answer that one as brief. And I would, I would absolutely love to come back and do a webinar on just neuropathy, if you okay. want. Okay, awesome. Because That'd be great. It's a really complex topic. Um, yep. The shorter version, until we get that booked for um, this listener, is when you have someone who has peripheral neuropathy, whether it's diabetic or chemo-related, is understanding their um, symptoms. There's what's referred to as negative symptoms and positive symptoms. A negative sy symptom is a void, so it would be numbness, right? So there's a lack of sensation, really. That's the negative symptom. The positive symptoms is sharp, shooting, crawling, um, burn, like feels like someone's splashing water. So they're, they're actual true sensations. Those are positive sensations. Um, knowing what the symptom is that you are referencing is important baseline. The other thing is that 90% of neuropathies that we encounter, particularly or especially as movement specialists, is sensory and not motor sensory, not motor. Why I emphasize that is that you can do all of the core stabilization and the short foot activation, still get them barefoot because you're in a controlled environment and you're teaching them to wake up the muscles of the feet. That will have a powerful effect on them. It may not reduce their symptoms. So their direct symptom of positive pain versus a negative numbness, but the motor output is still there, even though they might not have optimal sensation of their feet. You may want to think about turning up the volume 
of the stimulus that you're using, which could be any of the Naboso products, getting them barefoot, whole body vibration, or you can think of accessing the rest of the homunculus. So use their hands, stimulate the mouth, stimulate the eyes, stimulate the ears, and that would have a much stronger effect. Um, and I had said this is it's a really complex topic that I would love to do um, as a webinar. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, we'll, uh, we'll try to get you booked for January or February. Um, because I, I, I see several more questions on that topic. So <laughs> yeah. um, several people asking about your slides. I think you said you'd make those available to us. Yes, so I will email them to um, the team at FAI. If anyone wants my email, you 100% can email me. It's education at ebfafitness.com. Education at ebfafitness.com. I'll send you the slides or you can, I, I'd rather you bother me, don't. Harass well, the what we're going to do, what we're going to do, so Celia doesn't get 150 emails, yeah. um, is what we're going to do is we're going to post the recording of this. So if you're watching live, we're going to post the recording. If you're watching the recording, we're going to post the PDF of the handout um, with the recording. So just go to our right. Facebook wall so you don't have to just email. Sometimes we forget, like, oh, I'll just email Celia, right? I'll just email FAI. Well, if 100 of you email us, <laughs> it gets a little overwhelming. So, yeah. um, all right. So, um, lots of great shout outs to you. Excellent content. Thank you. Um, K Kennedy says we have the best education. Do you know who Kennedy is? I do. Okay. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> um, so somebody's asking about the insoles. Maybe you can go back to the slide that shows the picture. Somebody's asking about a photo. Um, and there are three different types of insoles. Can you explain the difference? Yes, so we have, and this is just kind of a, a pictorial representation. I don't have a picture up that shows um, the neurostimulation, same thing with our mats, but on our website, it, it has it. Real quick though, we have the 1.0, which is the bottom. That's a one millimeter texture. We have the 1.5, which is a 1.5 millimeter texture. And then the blue box is our neuro insole. You could think of that as our clinical insole. It is the most stimulating. Um, it is the um, most finite stimulus, I guess you could say, um, depending on the condition, the medical condition, the sensation of the individual's feet or their age, you would kind of grade them on where it would be appropriate to direct them. Most of seniors, baby boomers, neuropathy, Parkinson's stroke, kind of all that, that catch all, I would direct them to either the 1.5 or the Nero. Um, research has been around more than Nero. The videos that you saw were the 1.5. So just kind of direct them there. If people are going to run in the insoles, we put them towards the 1.5 or the 1.0. You can use them to activate your feet. You can recover or you can just wear them all day, which is what I do and what most people do. All right, great. So Andrea says this webinar has been one of the most interesting and exciting I have ever participated in. Um, I will start incorporating some of the activating techniques right, right away. So big thank you to you for that. Um, nice comment there, Andrea. Um, Terry is interested in the certification course. Um, can you give us just sort of a, a quick 60 second overview and then where we go for more info on that? Yes, so our education certifications, Barefoot Training Specialist, we have three levels under that. All of them are offered around the world. I have 40 master instructors who teach them as well. They're in numerous languages as well. You can find any of those workshops on our website, ebfaglobal.com. That will link you to um, a listing of all the workshops. We go into the foot core integration, how to activate the feet, how to get into the core through your feet, how to coordinate breath with foot core activation. Uh, we go into heavy foot anatomy, foot assessment, foot typing, and in our level two, we go into gait, how to assess gait, the evolution of gait, uh, most common gait imbalances and how to correct those or start to correct those. And then our level three links a little bit more into emotion uh, and evolution. So it's a super comprehensive. Think of it very holistically, very complementary to any other education that's out there. I know with FAI would be completely complementary. Um, yep. it, it tries to just bring a little bit of focused um, highlight into how powerful our feet are as a foundation. And then looking at that foundation always from an integrated perspective. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, we've loved your stuff uh, since our very first conference in 2015 when you did a certification workshop there. And, um, you know, Cody and I talk all the time about how we got to get people training on their feet. And then, of course, you're the one that really talks about the, the whole foot aspect, right? So what's happening at the foot. So it's very foundational. Um, I, I actually have this question as well. Roy is asking about uh, the Naboso uh, with socks versus skin contact. And I was wondering that for the mat versus the insoles, right? If so, if somebody's putting this in their shoe, are they wearing their socks? Are they going barefoot? Yes. So ideally, it is skin to surface contact. So that means you would be barefoot on the mat, barefoot on the insoles. Now, if you refuse to go barefoot or you're in an environment that is cold, etc., all those things, you sweat a lot, um, then you can wear thin socks. So thin socks. And then we also do have some people that put them in their socks. So no socks, thin socks, or within the sock. Um, and people have been happy with all of those three different environments. Again, just remember the more or the closer the skin is to the insole or to the mat, the more stimulus you get. Okay. Uh, you're getting lots of uh, yes, please for the neuropathy webinar. Yes to the neuropathy <laughs> webinar. Please, another webinar. Uh, so uh, we will try to, to, to hold Emily to that. Um, I want to do it. I want to do it. <laughs> Um, Marion says, awesome content, uh, curious on how these theories can be integrated into a group fitness setting, especially the, the breathing techniques, um, some of your thoughts on, on especially large groups. Yeah, so I actually incorporate um, kind of the, t the tease of it in a, in a workout under EBFA that's called Bear. So if she wants to come to New York <laughs> and take my class, um, <laughs> it. in any of our certifications, we do workouts that show how you can incorporate uh, homunculizing and eye movements and vestibular movements in a class setting. Um, same thing with the breathing. And if, if some of the listeners want to learn a little bit more on what's called somatics, somatic exercises, somatic movements, that, that's very complementary to our education and our movement. Um, but we do have an education called Bear, which is our workout that, um, I believe you said her name was Mary, right? Mary asked. Um, actually, or, actually it's, it's Marion and Marion's a he. Okay. <laughs> so, Mary. Yeah. You, you probably heard me say Mary cause I said it fast, but, and then Mar Marion said, it's actually my father's fault. It's a he. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> um how uh, somebody's asking about the different languages how does is it if they hop on your website is it easy to to find the certification in spanish uh yes 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 so okay. we have courses that are in um in 2019 we have spain obviously but then in mexico south america i mean they literally are all over the world okay and we have amazing master instructors who teach it in their language and then i've been to many countries that um it's translated as I'm, as I'm speaking. Okay, great. Uh, Donna in Alaska, I love this. She says, we can't barefoot for the majority of the year. Uh, the insoles are very much needed here. So for that sort of climate, you recommend the insoles inside your sock? I would do that, yeah. If you're wearing, you know, some thick, like woolly socks to stay warm, I would put them inside. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, you're probably not gonna go barefoot if it's uh, below zero, so. Um, there's, I think there's someone interested in taking you up on it. She says, yeah, I'm in New York. So, okay. um, all right, let me, there's a couple more questions here. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so okay. Dawn says, sorry, already emailed Celia. Um, Beth, <laughs> Beth says, I have Parkinson's in my family history. Any indication that barefoot exercises potentially prevent disease or slow progression? Um, no, however, if you start to have the earliest representation or the earliest diagnosis of any condition, but especially a neurological condition that is chronic, the sooner you get onto optimizing your motor coordination and motor uh, patterns, and then you just continue with it, obviously the better. I would also um, check out some of the research around Parkinson's and emotion. There's a really good book that everyone should read. Um, it's called When the Body Says No by Dr. Gabor Mate. And it speaks about the stress emotion link to a lot of uh, chronic conditions that we see and, and treat as movement specialists and um, you know, healthcare professionals. And if we can help them 
fully understand integrated holistically. The movement side is one part, 100%, but the rest of their state and being also needs to be addressed. Um, so the listeners might find that really interesting. Um, and then, of course, related to the, the Parkinson's in the family, you want to understand any of the risks besides just, oh, it's genetic. It's actually epigenetic. Um, have the Naboso products and sensory techniques demonstrated uh, any sort of benefits for spinal stability or spine health? Yes. Uh, we have a woman who uses it in her scoliosis program. Uh, I'm drawing a blank on her name right now, but she has a scoliosis program. And then we have several spinal cord injury uh, docs that recommend it for their patients. Hmm. So yeah, that's, that's a category as well. Okay, great, great. All right, we've got uh, more questions that I'm going to get to because I want to honor your time, but I'm going to wrap up with two last ones here. So Pat, Pat actually asked a, a foundational question that we probably should have started with. Um, do you find that folks are reluctant to exercise without their shoes on? Uh, I used to years ago when I first started doing barefoot training. And now, like when I teach classes, I don't really get any hesitation when I travel to conferences, you know, there's probably like 0.5% of people that are resistant. And if they do, or they're not willing to take their socks off, especially in a group setting, I'm usually sensitive. That is probably something personal. Like, I don't know, maybe they have stinky feet or something. I don't know. But I, I try to understand that it, it may be just something within themselves of what it is or some barrier or fear. And then um, I will tell them, try what we're doing at your own home, right? Your privacy, your home, your floor, and see if you feel the difference. I know they're going to feel the difference. So when you feel that difference, that's going to convince you versus me trying to like, come on, come on, come on, come on, take it off. Um, them trying it and feeling it, they have to make that decision for themselves. Um, and if they don't, unfortunately, they're missing out <laughs> on the power of barefoot. It's, it's, so much more commonplace now though that people are barefoot or in minimal shoes that there's less barrier yeah yeah um roberta is asking when is the next fai summit so i've got to close with that it is uh, june 14th and 15th in albuquerque new mexico and of course everybody asks why on earth are you going to albuquerque new mexico um i'm not sure if you know the answer to this but it's because twenty thousand senior athletes are converging on Albuquerque from June 14th to June 25th for the National Senior Games. So we thought we should have our conference there. So June 14th and 15th is the summit, and June 13th is the pre-con day where you can take uh, Emily's uh, certification workshop. We've got several uh, half-day pre-cons on the 13th, so we hope to see you all there. So Emily, thanks so much for your time. This has been uh, really an overload of content, high-end stuff, lots for us to think about. And uh, definitely going to hold you to coming back in January or February uh, to talk specifically on neuropathy. Absolutely. It was an honor, and I do want to come back. So let me know when. All right. We'll hold you to it. Thanks so much.